I am Riccardo Bellofiore, uh, on my right there is Joe Michel who is visiting here from the University of uh, Western Anglia, West Anglia, England, England. <laughs> West of England, West of England, I always say Anglia, I don't know why. Uh, this uh, seminar is based on a paper that I am circulating which is a chapter on a book just published right now uh, by Daniela Tavashi and Luigi Ventimiglia that Joe knows very well because all three were at SOAS. Uh, the book is uh, of a new collection by Routledge. The title is Teaching the History of Economic Thought. Uh, actually, this 11 thesis on political economy uh, were uh, originally written by me in 2001, very sure that there have been various uh, incarnations. Actually there were 10 theses, there were 10, not 11. When I had to publish in a proper way, I asked myself, no, they can't be 10, they must be 11. I don't explain to you why, you can, you can ask in the... Uh, in, in the part on the questions. Uh, in the book I give an explanation of, of the various occasions uh, of the various occasions of the uh, publications. Okay, I, I just simply go down with the thesis, then we will have the comment by, by, by Joe. Uh, first is, is the capitalist economy is again in a profound sy systematic and structural crisis. This fact has been followed by a player for more pluralism in the teaching of economics. Among the protagonists of this request of pluralism, we have the, the group of students who are thinking economics, which is an international experience. I, I think that this, this, this request and this uh, Structural crises are a useful point of departure to discuss the role of this history of economic thought in the curricula, in the economics faculty and departments. Uh, a thing that I, I like to do together with uh, a discussion of the 50s and 80s Italian tradition in political economy. I call this an Italian tradition. Uh, I will explain to, to who. I, I, I am referring, uh, and for, for lack of a, of a better term, I think that rethinking economics, this group of students could very much profit from the Italian tradition. I think also that usually most of the uh, economists in the various Italian departments could profit uh, about the Italian tradition. Unfortunately, this tradition is more even not already dead in Italy because of the accelerated normalization of the Italian university. Second thesis, it exists a positive uh, and distinctive peculiarity of the role that the history of economic thought has played in Italy since the 50s. Uh, the first example of the Italian tradition, this was argued by Augusto Graziani in the 80s, was Claudio Napoleoni's Dizionario di Economia Politica in 1956. It was half written by him, half written by well-known scholars, and it was the actual first uh, experience of uh, deprovincialization of, of, of Italian culture relatively to the Anglo-Saxon uh, Anglo economic thinking. Uh, Italy was very well trained at the time in Austrian and German uh, economic theory. Uh, I just open a parenthesis, Claudio Napoleoni has not, an, uh, had not a university degree. <laughs> uh, the specificity uh, I'm talking about informed Italian economic thinking, especially in the 60s and the, in the 70s, but it's been attacked since the early 80s, U-turn in economic theory and economic policy. U-turn is a term which was used by Luigi uh, Spaventa uh, to, to express the, the, the change of mind in uh, economic theory and economic policy, as I said. Uh, today we are much 
further on the road of uh, this uh, U-turn because now we are actually witnessing uh, in the parliaments, in concourses and everywhere a kind of ethnic cleansing against that tradition. Uh, what was distinctive about that tradition? The fact that in, in that there was no clear-cut distinction between the positive construction of knowledge in economic theory and economic policy and the history of economic thought. That is, history and analysis went together. That amalgamation between economic theory and the history of economic thought was essential for these authors, both for the research producing knowledge on, uh, on economy and for the teaching that had to accompany that research and that knowledge. The names, this is the third thesis, the names of the best authors within the Italian traditions. They are well known, or they should be uh, well known. Augusto Graziani and Cardinal Napoleoni, I already named them, but also Paolo Silos Labini in Rome, Marcello De Cecco in Siena, then Pisa, Luigi Lodovico Pasinetti in Milan Cattolica, Garegnani, uh, Vianello, Ginsburg died uh, two months ago, I think, Federico Caffè, Ciro, Ciro Lombardini. Uh, I made a choice to, to name only dead people with one exception. Luigi Pasinetti, who was a candidate for the Nobel Prize and, of course, never got it. Economic theory was thought by these authors as a discipline crossed by the contemporary existence of alternative styles of scientific thinking. The more common term is paradigm, paradigm. Uh, these alternative styles of, of scientific thinking in, uh, in, in uh, economic theory uh, were not only different, but they were in deep conflict one with the other, both relatively to the fundamental theoretical grounds and to the analytical results. For most of the authors I've named, uh, each of the conflicting approaches had unresolved uh, internal difficulties. There was no uh, paradigm which was free from problems. There is probably one relevant exception, which was Galignani. Uh, there was a division among these authors uh, on the issue if this problematic status of economic theory could be solved within the received knowledge. I have been uh, a pupil in a sense both of Napoleone and of Graziani both thought that you had to go beyond the received uh, knowledge. This, this historical analytical evaluation of the competing theories was taken to be preliminary to any advance on the contested terrains among the different approaches. That is, to go uh, forward in knowledge, you have to look back at how the, the categories uh, uh, were, were um, considered and studied in, uh, in economic theory, but from the questions of today. This is what I call a backwards reading of the history of economics too. Uh, of course, you had to select the, the area in which this was to be done. And they think it was value and distribution, money and inflation, reproduction and crisis. Fourth thesis, the intermingling of research into the history of economic thought and the proposition of novel perspectives in economic analysis, in my view, has saved most of these Italian economies from what they would say are twin evils. One is the unoriginal subalternity to the mainstream. This is what we are doing today, at least in Italy. Uh, the second is heterodox sectarianism. This, in my view, is very much diffused outside of, uh, of Italy. When I go to the ASA conferences in the new in the US, just to give you an image, that they are done in a couple of hotels, more than 1,000 uh, 1, rooms. Uh, it is pluralistic. Hmm? Let us say 90, 50% of the rooms are of the mainstream. I prefer to use the plural, mainstreams. Then there are five for the feminists, five for the Smithians, for, for the Marxians, uh, or the Marxists, uh, six for the 
postkinesias and you can uh, you, you you can go you can go on. Usually those communities stay in that same room, don't go to see another one. Well this is the worst of uh, the mainstream and heterodox sectarianism. I think that uh, this intermingling of research and the history of economic thought uh, has been instrumental to, to produce another positive peculiarity of the Italian tradition. Uh, there was in these authors a close interdependence between the con theoretical controversies and the economic policy interventions. These authors were very much on the news paper, just to say the 5th of May of 1974 on El Manifesto, it was published an article of Claudio Napoleoni, it was practically his lectures three, <laughs> three, three, three days before. Uh, this second trade uh, was a safeguard against another pair of evils in the view. Excessive simpl simplification, you know, it is very usual that the heterodox very much sim talk about everything hmm, with a very uh, poor knowledge of the mainstreams. Mainstream authors usually don't uh, intervene on heterodox streams because they really don't know anything. So it's a, it's, it's a bit of a problem. Uh, but the other, the other evil here is the heterodization divorced from reality. Hmm? This absolutely was not there. Even among heterodox there are insults of this kind where very often the the neo ricardian school of Garegnani is thought to be very abstract with no connection with reality. I am not a neo ricardian of the Garegnani kind, but I was testimony of fierce uh, past and present uh, fights uh, on economic policy. Fifth thesis, staying close uh, to this Italian tradition, I think that one should reject other possible definitions of the history of economic thought as the history of the continuous expulsion of errors and the glorious processual construction of a unique truth in economics, which of course is the mainstream, neoclassical or standard macroeconomics. Second, the history of economic truth as a mere chronological sequence of unrelated economic doctrines, the history of which is irrelevant to the theoretical and applied practice of the economists. Third, history of economic thought as preparatory study to justify the adoption in the presence of some eclectic, some oppositions. Why to teach the history of economic thought in the undergraduate or even in the graduate curriculum? With this other definition is uh, not really uh, interesting. The Italian tradition was constructed on a principle, what I, 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 I called it is a straff expression actually doing history of economic thought with a backward reading from our questions. Uh, but uh, another expression is one that I found in Marcello De Cecco, every history is contemporary history. He didn't tell who was the author, so I went to see and with my surprise I saw that the phrase is from Benedetto Croce. Uh, if you take this backwards history and this approach of the Italian tradition, it is clear that the history of economic thought is not only useful for your culture. Uh, it is unique and irreversible in the construction of both economic knowledge and economists. The inner problematicities the, of, of the theoretical status of the economic science, this is the argument, requires a deep investigation of the basic categories should account for the discussion of the past. For most of these authors in the Italian tradition, this inquiry must be given to the students from the first year of the undergraduate curriculum. Sixth thesis, the understanding of the history of economic thought uh, that I put forward, these backward readings, has sometimes been defined as the history of economic analysis. This is my preferred uh, Term. Mm. Uh, this was actually the way Schumpeter titled a book, or at least it was titled this way after he died in 1954 by the wife, 
uh, and uh, it is the way Schumpeter approached the authors of the past. You didn't go to read Schumpeter to know what actually was written. There was always an investigation from a certain point of view. Uh, otherwise, you would not understand why he said that Barras was the most uh, relevant author in, uh, on money, in monetary theory. You have to look at the italics and the footnotes and understand that the argument was that it was the most important if you look at the circular flow, not if you look at the inner dynamic capitalist change, which is uh, uh, what is important, that is what Schumpeter did actually. But a similar method was in Marx. His theories of surplus value are done with these backward readings from his own questions of what he thought were unresolved problems in economic theory. The same is the attitude in Keynes. The same is the attitude in Zraffa, uh, when he, uh, this expression, expression of backward readings is uh, uh, in the notes when he was preparing the lectures on the theories of value and distribution when he went to Cambridge and he had to teach for three years. He hated teaching and I fully understand him. Uh, but it's also it's not peculiar only of a terrorist. Ben Bauer wrote Capital and Interest confronting the theories of the past with the same attitude. Hmm? So my idea is that uh, ether economic thought is integral and indispensable not only to research but also to, to the formation of the economies. Here I have in mind especially the German term uh, Bildungs, Bildungs uh, Roman, is sometimes called. Uh, I, I skipped the, the uh, seven thesis. Uh, one may ask, does this approach only allow for a backward reading of the authors of the past? No. Uh, because one can think that this is an arbitrary way of looking at the history of economic of the past. No, this risk can be avoided if you are doing, properly speaking, history of economic thought. You, you have to reconstruct the context, the method, the language of the different uh, theories and, uh, and uh, authors. What you surely learn with this approach is uh, that you have not to privilege the mainstream language and assessment of what is economic Theory. This is what is done today eh? in uh, every basic, almost every basic course of, uh, of economics. With the idea that there is one single method that is good for economic theory. And not only for economic theory, for social science in general, it is called economic imperialism. Uh, if you do this, the thing that I dislike, well, you are allowed to publish in the A journal. The emphasis in the history of economic analysis, in my view, is not so much on pluralism, I will come back on this in a minute, but on stressing the plurality of the styles of economic thinking and on the non-linearity of the development of economic thought. Uh, Yes, I said that the Italian tradition entered into a phase of decline, that crisis, eventual regression since the 80s. The crisis came from the inside and from the outside. From the inside, here I'm thinking especially of those who do history of economic thought, there were two uh, big families. One was the family of uh, the historians of economic thought, strictly speaking. They prefer to go with the economic historians and uh, they want to select people only according to the interest in documents and archives. Mm -hmm. There was another family. This other family was uh, the family of the political economists, uh, which, being somehow related to this Italian economic tradition, were interested in, uh, in the history of economic thought. This is the reason why, at the early 2000s, the Association for the uh, Italian Association for the History of Economic Thought, which is called AISPE, A I S P E, broke down. And there was a new society, it's called STORE. Uh, in the first, the strictly economic historians, economic, uh, historians of economic thought, in the other, the political economists interested in. So there was a, a congress of AISPE when the, the break was. 
uh, defined. I was there. This is the origin, actually, of, uh, of the thesis. You know, people were discussing in the corridors. I thought that it was, it was good, as always, or even in my department, I think so, that the dissent should be elevated to some kind of theoretical argument. So I made an intervention of 10 minutes, which actually the origin of this of this thesis. Uh, another factor in making things worse has been university reforms. They have reduced, there is a, unfortunately a typo in uh, <laughs> that is spectacle. In the article is 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 it's written the economic policy content of the courses. No, actually university reforms have reduced the political and economic content of the courses in favor of a business accountants, accountancy culture and metric designed to appeal to students wishing to escape the supposed unrealism of economics faculties. Rating economics as all the other criticism from students have always been against the unrealism of economics theory. There was a French movement in 2000 uh, against the autism of economics theory. Uh, meaning abstractions, if, if you don't want, want abstraction, uh, business uh, economics is, uh, is okay. I think this is a trap. What is at issue is not abstraction as such, good theorizing starts from abstraction, but the kind of abstraction from which you start. And I think that you should start from the world in which we live in, which is an evolving capitalist monetary production economy. If you think of these words, you'll see <coughs> the cause of Schumpeter, Marx, and Keynes. I think that the request for pluralism is not enough. Not because there should not be pluralism. Of course, there must be pluralism. Uh, it is a minimal, ethical, basic requirement to allow students to do what? To access the plurality of views. Heretics. The heretics I, I named, Schumpeter, Keynes, Marx, never asked for pluralism. They had a bolder attitude. Keynes' principle of effective demand was presented as a general theory versus Marshall. Neoclassical theory was just a partial, uh, limited approach. Schumpeter did the same in his theory of economic development. He proposed it as more general and relevant than Barra. It's what I said before. Marx, Marx of course started, it was full of praise with, with uh, Ricardo, but he turned Ricardo's labor theory of value upside down, introducing the theory of the value form, introducing uh, the notion of abstract labor, so that the theory became actually labor theory of value, a macro monetary theory of capitalist production and exploitation, something that we are starting to understand now, almost 150 years after. All these authors actually proposed a revolution in economic theory. They wanted to uproot real analysis and to upload monetary analysis. What is real analysis? The terms are from Schumpeter. Real analysis is the idea that you start from a barter, economy, and all the essential things are there, then you complicate it. Monetary analysis is what Schumpeter thought should have been should be done, it was done by Marx, it was done by uh, by Keynes, <laughs> is to think that money must be in, in the ground floor, of, of the, even below the ground floor, uh, the building. Hmm? They wanted to be the new orthodoxy. They were heretics and because they thought themselves as founders of a, of a new approach, not as internal dissenters. Ninth thesis, taking this line, the first duty in teaching economic theory uh, is to teach it with a historical sensibility. Let me be clear. Now the argument has shifted from a defense of the presence of history of economic thought to the argument that every, every discipline in every economics faculty must be taught with a, an historical sensibility. And this has nothing to do with being orthodox or non-orthodox. In France, until uh, a few years ago at least, every textbook gives the different theories, not only different models, mostly of one theory, but different theories. 
so you educate students in a critical thinking that is grounded on the plurality of divisions and models that are in conflict. Of course, there is a risk here. If you allude to the conflict of ideas, you allude to deeper antagonism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, Eastern economic thought is marginalized in economics degrees at all levels. When I started teaching Eastern economic thought, I was in a minor uh, position. Four students, three students, seven students, it was going to die. It actually died, and it was disappeared from the... For a series of, of events, now what is done is exactly what should be done. It is in the first year of, uh, of the curriculum, though I think it is useless for 170 people, half of them, which will move to, to, to the business uh, economics course the next, uh, the next uh, year. Hmm? Uh, it is very difficult to find a course of the history of economics thought even in postgraduate. Huh? Their presence is a measure of the residual academic power of the individual teachers. These courses may die, in the text I am more positive, will die, but I say may die with the retirement of those professors. I am pretty near the retirement, so be happy. Ten pieces. The vanishing distinctiveness of the Italian economics profession, uh, Italian tradition actually, the loss of prestige of the history of economic thought, the relentless marginalization of heretics and, and of the historian, historians of economic thought are all phenomena that go together, though they are not identical. Mm? Uh, the strategy of many heterodox economists is of finding refuge in associations and journals of the history of economic thought. I think this is understandable, but it is short-sighted. It is of course true that the history of economic thought is still more open to pluralism, pluralism than other specialization in economics, but this is a kind of Indian reservation, I, thought, I hope the term is right. Uh, you pay the relatively tra relative tranquility with higher irrelevance in economics department. I think I am an heretic macroeconomist, an heretic uh, monetary economist, and actually this seems to recognized as such in the world uh, arena. Uh, but you also pay because the teaching of economics to undergraduates, yes, you, you do what? You do uh, Blanchard and people like that for macro macroeconomics. Uh, so my point is not only about research, it's also about the teaching, but it's also about the selection of the economists. If my diagnosis of the situation is correct, what is urgent is a radical turnaround. And it should pass also from the selection. It is important that economic theory should be practiced with sensibility of how the concepts and problems have been born uh, and how they have evolved. This is more true now than ever. John Robinson spoke in the mm, 70s of a second crisis of economic theory. I have uh, re-actualized uh, re, uh, this expression with the third crisis of economic theory. You go to, to Google and you put down third crisis of economic theory or terza crisi della teoria economica and you find my name for three pages and you find videos and articles. The turnaround must implicate not only, as I said before, a thinking of economic theory, not only the discourse of teaching, but also uh, a way to deal with selection. I think that the thorough knowledge of the competing approaches in their diversity must be a compulsory requirement for becoming a professor of economics. I realized this when in a concourse there was a researcher who thought that one, we are pluralist, one can do whatever he wants. Eh? But after he came into, he must know mainstream. The mainstream is neoclassical economic theory. Actually, no. The main, the, the, what they need to know is game theory for this young researcher. 
Uh, yes, I think that so that the historical dimension of categories, the plurality of these types of economic thinking, the problematic status of contemporary mainstreams need to be part of the basic teaching from the first undergraduate course to the master's and PhD programs. Every course that I have ever done, even macro, it was in the second course. In the 90s, I did a lot of uh, basic macroeconomics uh, or ma monetary uh, uh, economics. I always do in this way an approach to the different theories, which is also implicitly or explicitly an historic uh, approach. That's the 11 thesis. So, yes, more or less, I stayed in my time. <laughs> Maybe it's, uh, do you need any computer? No, no I don't have uh, okay. slides. Um, it's very nice to be here in Bergamo and uh, to meet you all and to discuss these things. And I hope we have plenty of opportunity to, to discuss. So I'll give some, some comments on uh, the paper uh, we just heard and, I, and I've been reading it the last few days. Comments are always very boring when all that you say is that you agree with what the previous speaker said, and so my problem here is that I actually agree with a large amount of what we just heard. Um, so in, in light of trying to keep this reasonably interesting, I will focus on uh, possible areas where we might find some disagreement and hopefully I can provoke a reaction and we can, we can, we can, we can discuss. Um, so what I'll do is consider uh, the comments on pluralism, and particularly uh, in light of macroeconomics in particular, again, uh, the area which I'm interested in, um, and less so on the Italian tradition because I am aware that I know not very much. I've studied uh, Graziani, uh, I've studied uh, Bassinetti and Garinani to a degree, and many of the other authors I know by name and not much more, so my, my comments on the Italian tradition will be more limited. Uh, one thing I've learned here is that I need to I want to learn both Italian and more uh, of Italian. There is a short bibliography that said to them at the end, since it was published in any, with four or five uh, publications for each of the names. So we are at the starting point. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Um, the opening statement is that the capitalist economy is in a profound <coughs> systemic crisis. And I think in a, in a sort of strange way, the mainstream agrees, although it will, it will answer it in a very different, you know, the language is very different. They will talk about secular stagnation, interest rates at zero, lower bound, a negative natural rate of interest and so on. But taken together, these, these statements do, I think, in some ways uh, constitute an acknowledgement that there is a profound crisis of some kind and a crisis of, of their understanding. Because if you'd said 20 years ago when, when these concepts were being developed, that you could have this configuration of these concepts, they would say, no, don't be silly, that's not, that's not how these things work. So I think there is actually an acknowledgement there. On pluralism, I think implicitly, or actually in part explicitly, uh, Ricardo has suggested that the rethinking call is too, t is too timid, it's too modest, we should have a much greater um, ambition. So I want to say something uh, in, res in response to this. I should first disclose that I am a founder member of a group called Reteaching Economics, the tagline is academics committed to pluralist economics teaching, something like that. And we were set up explicitly to support the rethinking students, uh, to be a sort of academic um, support base for them. So as the English say, I have a, a dog in this fight, so I'll support my dog yeah, to, some, to some degree. Um, but I, actually, I, 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 I agree with them. It will be a partial. Uh, defense of pluralism, because actually I agree that it's it's a limited uh, aim and our ambition must be higher, but I, let, let me offer a defense as far as I'm, I'm willing to offer. Um, first of all, it's a strategy for teaching, and, and Ricardo has very clearly explained why uh, uh, pluralism is essential in teaching. It's an appeal that students should see all the available options, that they shouldn't have to take the teacher's view on which ideas are suitable and which are, are not. There was a I think of a comment by Brad DeLong I read a couple of nights ago when he was talking about Marx for the 200th birthday. He said the only people who should be allowed to read Marx are people who have already had a thorough neoclassical training because they're the only people whose brains won't be melted by this, this dangerous acid um, stuff. You know, that kind of view where you know only ideas that I think are safe 
and in, in, in order I'm willing to present them to you, you're, you're allowed. This is this is this is unacceptable, and, and, and students students can see through it. As soon as students you know, see a range of views and, and learn how to think critically, um, that they see through this. I do have a. I can always argue with myself on this one. I, I, I go around in circles. Is one question I have is is what is an economics education for? And I think it does depend on who the students are. It depends if they're going to be working in you know, the supermarket back office doing accounts in later life or if they're going to become professors aware on that spectrum. In some cases, students just need a basic set of tools, I think, and, and you know, confusing them with the Cambridge capital controversies and so on doesn't help. So I think I haven't solved this one. In some cases, you need to do deep pluralism. In some cases, you just need a sensible set of tools, which actually, in my view, is, is a plural. You know, always will be, you know, it's, not, it's not just going to be utility functions and all this kind of stuff. It probably isn't going to be that stuff at all, to a degree. Um, it's a strategy in the yes, UK. Sometimes, since you have not the microphone, I okay. see some faces. Ah, and not, not if you do also like me, you start very high. Okay. <laughs> decrease the um, it's a strategy in the UK and I think internationally for public awareness. The rethinking students have been very successful in raising publicity and getting high profile people like Bank of England officials and Financial Times journalists and so on uh, on board, getting high, you know, high profile quotes and things which you can stick on the billboards. Much more successful than the academics have been and they have done it using this um, tagline. So in that respect I think it has been. Um, very useful. And it's an approach to coexistence in academic departments. As, as we've heard, there are, in many cases, fundamentally opposing views, and this can make things difficult within institutional structures when you have to essentially tell students quite different stories. Um, and pluralism is one way to you know, it's not perfect, but it, in my department it's the sort of word we use to smooth over the cracks when things get a little bit um, uh, difficult around the edges. So we say we are a pluralist department, we respect each other's positions, we respect each other's views. You know, in a way, I think it's really a, it's another word for short-term truth. You know, short-term truths can hold longer than, than, than they otherwise might. So it's one strategy, it's one part of the approach, but it's not the only, uh, by, any, by any means, um, strategy. Um, on the point about criticism of abstraction and Formalism, uh, I, I agree, I and mean, you have to have abstraction, of course, otherwise you don't have theory. Theory, by definition, almost, I think, is, is abstraction, although I'm aware how weak my grasp of philosophy is. I think it's been a couple of days discussing with Ricardo, so I should be careful how much I say on this. Uh, on formalism, I actually think mathematics has a, an important role. Again, probably we might emphasize it differently, but I think it's hugely over um, viewed and overstated as, as a sort of final scientific arbiter or, or, or the, the ultimate um, sort of uh, winning, winning call in economics. Does the maths uh, hold up? It, it's a tool and it should be used sensibly. In the UK recently there's been something interesting which has been there's been this endless series of articles criticising uh, mainstream economics almost more than one a week and they've, and they've increased in, in intensity over the last couple of weeks. There have been lots and lots of them. In, in high you know, profile um, publications like Prospect Magazine had one in the last couple of weeks. And one of the things they always say actually is that it's too mathematical and, and uh, it's, it's unrealistic and so on. And this in a way is an open goal for mainstream economists to say, well of course you need maths and of course you need abstraction. Um, so I think one thing we do have to be careful of is, and I think Ricardo said this, to know what we're criticising and to be accurate in our criticisms because I see so many inaccurate and uh, you know, ill thought out criticisms of the mainstream which actually are counterproductive. It just allows people to say, you don't, you don't know what you're talking about. So now let me come to history of economic thought and say uh, something on this. And again, uh, I'm going to have to make an effort to say something uh, new because I, I agree with pretty much everything uh, that, was, that was said. It's essential because without it, you get what we call a weak history, meaning that the winners write the history and they write it to suit what they currently believe. And that may not, and in most cases, is not true. Um, it is written history. this way, I think. It's to do with an English uh, tri um, political set, now, now defunct. They became what are now sure. called the Liberal Party. It was written in this way. Exactly, right? yeah, yeah, a WIC. Yeah. Um, it was a political grouping uh, in the, in the 
19th century <coughs> United Kingdom. We say weak history to, to mean history written by the winners for their own uh, purposes and, and erasing all of the in, you know, inconvenient details. Uh, it has a linear view of, of science. In some science, as I'm not sure how many, if any, but some sciences, at least at some points in time, do proceed relatively linearly. Linearly, there are new discoveries. They're tested. They're incorporated. Everybody agrees. You move forward. Economics really is, is not like this, as Ricardo says. There are competing, incompatible uh, views. There are fundamental incompatibilities. There are big jumps and, and swings. You know, Keynes, um, Schumpeter, Marx, uh, examples of that. And, and if you study history of economic thought, you, you realize this. You, you, you can't come away with this kind of uh, linear, Whiggish um, view. Um, there's something else history of economic thought is doing at the moment, which I think is very interesting, which is that it's making life uncomfortable for those who are trying to cling to this, uh, what I call, Whig history. And I'll give you one um, anecdote about this. There's a very interesting group uh, coming out of Paris at the moment. Um, doing history of recent macroeconomic uh, thinking, a recent macro history of thought. Uh, and one of the members of that school, Beatrice Cherrier, um, has on her Twitter bio that she likes bath time stories. And I've never really stopped to, to think about that for very long. Until a few weeks ago, um, it, 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 she, she, she raised, somebody asked her, why, why did it say bath time stories on your, on your Twitter bio? And it turned out that Several years earlier, I had an argument with another economist called Tony Yates, who was at the Bank of England and was then a professor at several very high-ranking UK institutions. Um, and I got a bit angry, and, I, and he said something about history of economic thought's nice, but it's, it's bath-time stories. That's, that's its purpose. And I'd written something angry, saying this, you know, this exemplifies everything that's wrong with, with modern economics. Um, Tony's a very nice guy, and he sort of talks to me despite being rude to him and so on. Um, but Beatrice had taken this as her sort of her motto. Um, this, my, my complaints about this bath time stories um, tweet. Um, but what they're doing is very interesting because they're looking at the way mainstream macro has told its own history recently and then going back and checking the records and very carefully looking at actually what happened and finding that their, their own telling of their own recent history, 20, 30, 40 years, why was the representative agent uh, adopted? Why were rational expectations uh, adopted? Why only now do we get heterogeneous agent models? Why only now do we get financial frictions? Their stories, which are always very technical, they're about tractability, they're about computing power, you know, this linear approach of science is just advancing and we're just getting there slowly bit by bit. If you go back and you look at why certain assumptions were adopted, certain tools, certain methods, and some were excluded, it, it doesn't add up. And it's, it's clearly making things quite uncomfortable um, for people trying to stick to, uh, to, to that view. So it has, a, it has a, an active use in that sense, <coughs> and a deeper ambition. How am I doing for time, Ricardo? Oh. You spoke uh, 12 minutes, 18, something like that. Sorry, huh? I don't know, it's fine, let's go. <laughs> All right, thank you. Sorry. Um, for students, history of economic thought is essential, and uh, I think I've already said why. I, I want to tell you one more anecdote on this. We had an open day recently at my university, um, and I had some first-year students. I've, I've introduced history of economic thought as a first-year uh, course at, at my university. I've taught it for three years um, now. Actually, I initially thought it should be a second-year uh, course, but because of the uh, um, constraints of timetabling and so on, it could only fit in the first year. And I now uh, agree with what Ricardo said, I would always strongly argue for it to be a first year course. I realize it has to be there um, right at the beginning. Um, and so I had some of the first years come and they talked to the prospective students who are still at school and thinking about coming to visit us. And one of the students said, what's your favorite module here at, <coughs> at, at UE? And this student, who's a very, very bright um, student, Gave this great big long speech about history of economic thought and how it completely changed her view on everything she'd studied at school and she understood supply and demand and maths and she was good at that stuff and she thought that was all it was and she came to university expecting to learn this and now she'd learned about demographics and population and technological change and history and politics and how it all fit together and her whole life had changed and i wish i'd filmed it because if i had i could have put it on the, the university website as our sort of promotional um, video so it, when you see things like this, it really makes you realize how 
how much it's changing people's views, uh, and I think in the right direction. Um, and then when you see the students of third year having had you know, this kind of training at the beginning, um, their ability to really uh, critically evaluate uh, and, and give sensible answers on policy um, is, is I, I find, quite uh, encouraging. Um, Ricardo highlighted a distinction, I'm changing topic a bit here, on the difference between history of economic thought and history of economic analysis. And I've never stopped to think about this before. Um, simplifying and caricaturing, I suppose, there are two extremes. One is to try and tell the history as neutrally and as straightforward as you can. Of course, that's impossible because you editorialize just by who you include, what you leave out, and so on. But the other end is to, to use history to tell your own stories, your own interpretation, your own analysis, which I suppose is what you mean by history of economic analysis. I try to think that this must be controlled. <laughs> yeah. Um, the questions are important. <clears throat> I, I, the questions I, that one poses to the audience of the past. Yes, okay, but the, the, the questions you ask. I don't have much to say on that other than that I'd never stop to think about it, and I feel I now do need to stop and think a little bit more about how to, and I think both of these are essential. Um, but I think maybe we can be more explicit about how we do this. Um, as a strategy, I I do agree with with what was said. If you know, if you silo yourself just into history of economic thought, it is short-sighted and potentially damaging. We need history of economic thought, but we also need to avoid retreating into history of economic thought as you know, a safe place where we can. Where we can hide um, and, and therefore not remain engaged in, in, in live policy discussions, not remain engaged in positive contributions to theory, and therefore the, the, uh, the longer term strategy. I have a question uh, for Ricardo. I'd like to hear more about this interplay between policy, you know, sort of live policy making in the, in the, in the Italian tradition and uh, the, the, the economists who are theoreticians and history economic thought um, specialists, so I'd like to know there's some more examples of how that, how that worked out, because that sounds really interesting. So I, I, I do, you know, being critical for a minute, I do see heterodox economists um, retreating and, and not offering important positive contributions and just, you know, reading Adam Smith again. And, you know, I, I, if I go to a conference and I see a HET panel on Smith, I don't go to it anymore. I, I, I don't, I'm, maybe I'm being cynical, but I'm not sure I'm going to hear it. Um, okay, so what is to be done? I'm going to make some comments now on um, where I think we can we can go, and then I will I will conclude. Um, the decline of the Italian tradition, as much as I understand it, seems to me to be a, a tragedy, and I don't know what is, is to be done about that, um, other than to try and maintain traditions which, in some way, you know, have some elements of, of this. And I suppose that's what we're trying to do. Uh, at my university in, in Bristol. So what of this ambition to make positive changes? I'm going to identify one possible opportunity relating to contemporary um, macro. And I'd be interested to see if, if Ricardo disagrees with me on this, because some people disagree with me quite strongly on this. But there are, I think, very big changes actually going on in contemporary macro. If you go back 10 years or 15 years, you will find a representative agent, rational expectations, a stable Nairu, a demand side which is basically independent of the supply side, I should say it the other way around, a supply side which does its own thing, doesn't matter what demand is doing, the supply will just in the long run, will, will not react. Um, so no hysteresis in the, in the macro sense, not the labour market sense. No meaningful role for money and finance. Uh, no real meaningful role for monopoly. You know, you have monopolistic competition in the standard New Keynesian model, but in my view this is a way of getting price index into the system without actually thinking about what monopoly does in any, any meaningful way. Okay, prices are slightly above marginal cost, but it doesn't really do anything um, in the model. Now, if you, if you say this, some economists will always say, oh, well, look, there's this paper from 1983 where there's learning dynamics, so you're wrong. You know, it's not always the rational representative agent or whatever. I mean, this is just such a, a weak defense. So it's starting to die out of it. I think, really, they're accepting that this was the central set of beliefs. Sure, there were. You can always find a paper which bolts something on and makes a mind. You know, you, you've got diamond and dipping, you've got financial accelerator, equipment models, etc. But they're all, they're not the core of, of the belief structure. And I think all of those things which I just mentioned 
one way or another, are breaking down. You know, there's resistance. Some people won't accept some of those things, but you, you can see at, at the highest levels, people now questioning uh, and refuting the basic assumptions, I think, from only 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and what's interesting about this is they're moving towards what I would see as a much more um, heterodox position. They're moving towards views which have been widely held in heterodox economics for 30, 40, 50, 100, 150 um, years. And what's really interesting is that it's been done completely without acknowledgement. There's no, I mean, sometimes I'll mention Calvin or, or Kaletsky maybe in, in the introduction. And then there's, there's nothing between the, the 30s, maybe 1930s or 40s and 2017, when the first person to think that actually maybe productivity reacts to demand. Usually you have to add, yes, Galicia was good, but don't look at this, don't look at that. Krugman did exactly that at the LSE mm -hmm. <laughs> in 2010. Yeah, oh. don't, don't read political aspects of full employment, whatever you say. <laughs> <from Minsky. laughs> um, so I'm going to give you two examples. Now, one is from the recent ASSA, which I don't know if were you there, Ricardo, in Philadelphia in the, in the yeah. snowstorm? I wasn't there, but I was watching on social media and a couple of things. Actually, um, I was in my room except for my two sessions because it was really ah, in trouble. Yes. But yes. <laughs> so you As I said, you mean social structure or coalition? I mean, no, the no, American asset. Asset, yeah. Ah, no, no, I was there. Yeah, I was there doing my two sessions. <laughs> it was the in the US. So, so I watched. The, so, so I watched on social media and a couple of things. Uh, one thing stood out to me was a slide, and I think it was Philippon, who you know from New York uh, University, six new stylized facts that, that had been discovered. Concentration is rising, markups are higher, investment is falling, productivity growth has slowed, inequality has risen, and there is reduced fluidity, churn, and, and dynamism. Repeat the name? Philippon. Uh, Thomas. Yeah, yes. Philippon. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this was presented, up, as, far as, I could tip, as far as I could see, completely straight-faced as an astonishing new discovery. Something has changed, which, which we now need to, to explain. Welcome to Paul Suzy. <laughs> exactly. Well, welcome to uh, all of the things which I'm sure you've been learning uh, over the last years and months. Another example, a brand new paper from Gauti and Eggertson, um, two of the you know, leading macroeconomists of the current uh, day called Caldor and Piketty's Facts, The Rise of Monopoly Power in the United States. Far, again, five stylized facts. An increase in the financial wealth to income ratio despite low saving rates and the stagnating capital to income ratio and increasing Tobin's Q permanently above one, i.e. an overvalued stock market by, by book value. A decrease in the real, real rate of interest while the measured average return on capital remains constant. An increase in the pure profit share with decrease in the capital and labor share. What they mean there is, um, I would call, a rise in rents, actually. I mean, this, this is the standard production function interpretation, but I would call that a rise in rents. And a decrease in investment to output, even given historically low borrowing costs and a high stock market, high tokens queue. Again, if you've ever read Minsky, there's, there's nothing of, of you know, remotely, um, you know, it's the two price, it's Minsky's two price theory, near enough, you know, stated uh, with shock. And again, absolutely no, as far as I can see, um, acknowledgement. And I've raised this a couple of times, not with, with the authors directly, but with, with people reasonably uh, senior and so on. And I get a range of reactions. One is that, oh, it's just a mistake, they just didn't know. Another is, it doesn't matter, why are you making a fuss? You know, what matters is that we, we're getting it right now. Why are you making a big deal about this, you know, this history stuff? You know, go away, be quiet. Um, another is, are oh, you just wrong? You, know, you, you guys never really said that because you didn't say it properly. You never wrote it down. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, we wrote it. We, 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 you, know, you kind of maybe should have done because you kind of saw it coming, but you failed to actually do the, do the work. Uh, and there are a range of other um, reactions. But I think that history of economic thought in the recent, uh, telling the history of economic thought, heterodox history of economic thought to those people, you know, I'm, I'm going to try and, I'm, I'm trying to work on this at the moment, trying to put the paper together, put together a paper which actually um, identifies this and, and, and notes the, the correct antecedents. Uh, I'll be very interested to see if it gets published, I suspect it won't in, in the places I'm going to send it to first, um, i.e. the places that publish the original papers. Um, but I think there's a, there's a lot to be done there. You know, we can point out these things, and, and the work of the people in Paris is also you know, doing a really good job at uh, sort of shaking the foundations of, of some of this, um, you know, we are the scientists um, stuff. 
I also think actually there's a lot, to, and Ricardo again might disagree with me here, there is actually a lot to be, a lot of value and a lot of progress to be made by talking to mainstream macroeconomists who are willing to discuss in good faith. And I found there are lots of people actually who just aren't aware of this stuff and when you point it out they just say, oh that's amazing, I didn't realise we were doing that and that's outrageous. You know? I'm looking forward to your paper so I can tell everybody that they've missed. Particularly the younger people, I think, who never even were aware that there was a, you know, a sort of a conflict or there was an alternative view. It's, it's so hegemonic now that there are people, uh, young people in research departments who just don't even know that there was something else. You know? They don't know there's a Marxian stream or a post-Keynesian stream or a Serafian stream. And when you tell them, when you point out that there are papers 20 years ago saying exactly what they're saying now, they're actually really surprised and, and sort of interested by it. So I think there is um, potentially uh, progress to be, to be made there. We have to continue intervening in the policy um, discussions. That's absolutely um, essential. And I think you have to propose. And I have to propose. <laughs> so I I have no concluding remarks. On that, so okay. I think I've said. Uh, yes. I, I my my suggestion is the following. Since we have in principle a department meeting again at two thirty, which I guess will be two forty, right? Yes. Correct. Probably. So. Uh, I would say 20 minutes of questions and some answers by both of us. So, so even. thank you. So, well, I'm of course biased because I'm one of the subscribers in Italy of Rethinking Economic Manifesto. And let me say that I think that you didn't read it. So, uh, and in, in it, you had both um, probably one of answer to some of the issue you were pointing out and also some some point which would make a more complete critic and the point is that the manifesto is not about simply pluralism th theoretic pluralism it's about theoretic pluralism but first of all about pluralist in methodology so epistemology and ontology and transdisciplinarity so there is three dimensions, three pillars, and this is from the really beginning. This is what we put on Financial Times, Le Monde, all over the world. And actually, I think that you cannot uh, completely understand the value of pluralism in theory if you don't have some epistemological uh, basic tool. You know, you, you don't know what is a, what a paradigm is without uh, uh, philosophy of science. You don't know uh, what are the, the different way to build knowledge, uh, really, which, which in neoclassical then is just an application of, I don't know, the positivistic uh, thinking that the all is just a sum of the part. So uh, the need for abstraction is absolutely in there and is actually even more than just the um, uh, the looking for some theory, scientific theory. There is the need to understand the philosophy per condition of science. And, and um, this, uh, I think, must be done in the first year of, economic, of all scientific. You are not a scientist. If you go in a scientific department, you are supposed to become a little bit uh, a knowledge about what science is. So, Probably the first course, I think, should be some basic of epistemology. And I don't think that we need to spend a lot of time explaining these things. If you give some insight, people will be able to orientate themselves, to have some tool to reason, not just using memory, but also using intelligence, not to make some demarcation and have some method to do. And then the, there is the, the, the transdisciplinary call. So the, the, also the critics on the fact that we are going more and more into the, a more speciali specialized uh, scientific world in which the result of a, of a subject are not able to show their value for the other. And this also within the economics. And, uh, uh, and that, that's a little bit an answer to, you know, I, I agree with you, Professor, when you say that we don't need to go and explain all the little detail or the, the debate in, inside the history of economic thought. We, we, we just need to provide some tool. And uh, I think that the tool, the basic tool to, to help 
in, uh, this inquiry is to, pro to provide, let's say, the ability to find the nexus in method, in theory, and uh, in, um, let's say, in language. And, uh, and so that's why I think that there should be something before even history of economic thought. Uh, and then, just uh, for finish, when there, there is a critics for abstraction. So uh, all these movements started with the post-economic society, post-crash economic society of Manchester. And there, what was the issue? There was the financial crisis, and they were unable to read the war with the tools they were provided to them. So it's not like that there is the refusal of an abstraction, but the abstraction is useful and makes sense just if you are able to have an application. And application means forecast and uh, finding solution. If we build an abstraction, if at the end is not able to uh, provide any class in terms of forecast and practical application, there's no point in making any science. I mean, otherwise it's really just a uh, story buff story, which exactly. so. Uh, uh, be against buff stories doesn't need to be against uh, abstraction. Uh, yes, yeah, so just a call to put epistemology and transdisciplinary in the in the discussion. Okay, uh, other maybe show. Uh, then I have to. There are others. Let us see. Raise your hand if you want to be in the discussion. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I am also a fan and a follower of Beatrice Cherrier <laughs> Beatrice Cherrier on, the, on Twitter and yours as well. So I follow all the discussions. Uh, but let, let me add one thing. I wrote the name oh, yeah. of the blog by Joe Michel. Tell the other important names. Uh, Daniela Gabor is the Daniela Gabor, she's a rising, yeah. rising star in finance, and then probably... Mostly it's uh, myself and Daniela, occasionally it's yes. It's called Critical yeah. Finance. Uh, there are a few posts, but uh, excellent posts. Yeah. Um, from the discussions around the uh, Marx conference, I started, uh, restarted reading uh, uh, Michel Heinrich. Uh, because there were new points opening to me. And one of the things that were open was about this uh, history of economic analysis and the difference of history of economic thought and the history of economics. In the sense that uh, every uh, history of economic analysis is a rewriting uh, or, say, a reconstruction of, a, of the history of economic thought, to my view, because you have a theoretical element, you have a category, you have a specific question with which as a keyword you go and reread the history of economic thought. And that is, for example, what uh, Michael Heinrich does in this book and says that the logical uh, nexuses are very important. You are important. talking about Wissenschaft von Wert. Yes, yes, I'm talking about Wissenschaft uh, von Wert because the new book is about a, a biography of Marx which is being published. Yeah. It fifth uh, presented in Berlin in the conference, but it's, the same idea I think has been developed also in the new book is the um, the fact that the theoretical uh, there is a certain supremacy of theory to uh, there is a certain supremacy of the logical understanding, and then you go back and you reread history and reconstruct history. Sometimes you have to do even first-hand research on history because there's part of history that have never been written. Like, for example, the hierarchy between uh, Fordism and Taylorism comes from theoretical uh, uh, considerations first and then goes back to the history and rereads history and finds new evidence. So this is also uh, what is sometimes I see neglected in the uh, French group, uh, Beatrice Cherrier, they start with history. There has to be, a, I think, from an economic point, econom uh, economist point of view, there has to be a certain theoretical question to go back and investigate history. And that's very important. Otherwise, the history is written in different forms and one can actually be intrigued and remain a prisoner 
of the paradigms that are behind the history writers and the historiography of the his, uh, economic thought. So the question has to be posed very explicitly, and then the history of economic thought becomes meaningful. One, this one thing that I wanted to add. And then the other one is the, to, the critical reading is only possible when we have conflicting ideas, conflicting approaches. And I see this in the, in the me being a part of the thinking economics and considering myself as a part of this movement. Uh, I see as well that this has been somehow neglected because uh, the plurality is a precondition to arrive at some uh, englobing, incorporating theory. That has to be the, the, term, the ambition the, of, the, uh, of, of critical thinking, of uh, explaining the antagonistic theories better than they do, and at a higher level, maybe. Uh, that, that's, of course, the ultimate ambition. Uh, that's it. Okay, I, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I am biased because, you know, I'm a microeconomist. I'm mainstream microeconomics. Uh, I work on industrial organization and uh, innovation theory. And I use game theory as much as I can. Okay. So from this background, <laughs> I want to give you a, a different perspective in order to, you know, to help the discussion in somehow. Uh, well, let me say that I'm not completely under the value of ignorance because I know, I think quite well Schumpeter, I read a lot of Pasinetti and Graziani and so on. You know, I'm Italian, so I know the, the some Italian tradition. Okay, <laughs> fine. And let me finish. Uh, I'm not a macroeconomist, so I don't know exactly how is changing macroeconomics. You, you explained the, the big change in the last 10 years. I'm not really updated on this part, but well. Uh, so my criticism is, uh, first, about math and too much theory and technicism and so on. Well, I'm not really addicted on game theory. Uh, well, I'm not real keen on using game theory uh, in my courses. But I cannot use anything different. I mean, I need it. Otherwise, I'm not able to explain the same concept with some, I mean, rigorous analysis of the problem. And so this is a thing that is, uh, I mean, I think it, it, it's important. I, I still think that math or game theory or whatever technicism, technique uh, is an instrument. I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not overlapping content and methodology. I do understand the difference, but I still use that methodology because I don't have anything else. Okay, and I use it in the sense that I do believe that you know, a more sophisticated technical instrument will help to understand the economy. To, will help to, I mean, fix the problem and give a policy implication and so on. But given that I'm, I'm you know, I, I share the idea that history of economic thought, of thought sorry, is very much important. That's, it's a, a, an essential background. That's pretty obvious, but I don't see any contradiction between these two approach. I think that, a, I mean, a, a, an economist, a whole economist, has to know economic history, and that's for sure. Then there is another part of being an economist or just to understand what economics is, which is to know, to have some tools, you know, in order to apply, to solve uh, relevant and, uh, uh, I mean, uh, important, relevant issues. And let me move my criticism. Talking about the Italian tradition, uh, well, you mentioned a few guys I know, uh, but they are, they are all very old. Or I, you I, didn't I mention... I, okay. I chose that people. Yeah, <laughs> but my idea is that uh, you are still too much in the past, not you as Riccardo Bellofiore. What I'm saying is this uh, approach is too much in the past. Society, economics changed. The issue we have to deal with are changed. 
I cannot refer to Napoleone to solve a problem which is linked to, I don't know, asymmetric information inside the market, in the internet economics. I need new tools. I need two way of approaching the problem. And so that's my, 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 my main uh, uh, criticism. I mean, even the uh, mainstream economics is not the mainstream economics we chose the Valra one. I mean, it's completely different. The new, new classical paradox is, is very much different. And I think it makes an effort to move in a, in a, I mean, in a direction of being more realistic, uh, uh, not too much abstract, and to solve important policy implications. So that's my point. What I'm, I want to be very provocative. Uh, and so uh, it comes to my mind that maybe <coughs> heterodox approach uh, is not so uh, spread in the community because it's irrelevant. Sorry to say that, of course, it's a provocation, but I want to be provocative, you know. So, uh, that's Only my because point. because they have stopped. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing, yeah. Cleans. <laughs> yes, that could be an answer. And uh, let me say very, very last thing. I agree with you. The mechanism, I mean, the, the career mechanism, or the, let's say, the structure of the rewards, is really punishing uh, history of tough, different approach, heterodox approach, plurality, that's for sure. That's for sure. But the things that I hate, I want to be clear on this point. Okay. But maybe one, one reason is because it's not enough of the answer that we can give. Uh, what yes. you mean, sorry, how sure. you define irrelevant? What you mean with irrelevant? We are short of time. Uh, irrelevant. Uh, in this case, what does it mean? It means that it doesn't it provide doesn't any tools? anything interesting, useful, okay. and important <laughs> to say. Probably. Very briefly. First, I would like to have, from both of us, a definition of mainstream economics today. <laughs> no, that's My second. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I disagree. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but this, this, I think this is uh, okay, yeah. relevant. Sure. Secondly, and last, because I have an other question, but I think it's better to stop. Do you think that uh, um, university today, or especially the contents of the courses, are Demon driven by students or not? Okay. I think we can go on. I, I begin and you to. Uh, I will try to answer to most of the issues, though uh, not sure. Uh, I begin from uh, even Invernizzi. I said that I supported pluralism. Mm -hmm. uh, I, however, think that plurality is a different thing. And plurality comes exactly for, from an opposite view relatively to yours. That is, that is, I am not for epistemological pluralism. I am not for ontological pluralism. All the authors that I, I quoted, Marx, Schumpeter, Keynes, they are not pluralist in the sense. They had their own method. It was based on what they, they wanted to do. Huh? So I would invert exactly the, the reasoning. Uh, I agree with you that it would be good to have a course also, uh, I not, would not say it in the first year, about theories of knowledge. It actually happened that we had a course of theories of knowledge. But it happened that it was uh, uh, put in under political economy uh, as a <laughs> disciplinary boundary. I had done work on that, so I took the course. But it was not what the professor who presented <laughs> the, the thing wanted. So it, it disappeared in three years. You know that, that that's the real way that universities are managed. Um, Oh, what, what was said by, by 
Titi Batajo. Uh, I thank you, but I think it is completely wrong. And the reason is clear by what, by what he, he said. That is, if you go, that, that's paradoxical, because Italy in the 60s and 70s looked at the most open-minded uh, world of the profession, etc. But if you go after the 2007 crisis, 2007, not 2008, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world, in France, etc., there has been the uh, understanding that economic theory was in crisis. In Italy, the same debate was not there, because the arguments were exactly yours. Uh, because these people didn't mm, go to look now, I am talking of some Bolshevik uh, newspapers like the Financial Times, where Martin Wolf opened a debate on uh, the question, is capitalism uh, um, creating the seeds of its own destruction? Hmm? This was exactly the way in which, in the early 70s, the Marxians in Italy were discussing. Eh? And it was clear that, 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 that there was a danger. And there was another one, I think, Willem Boiter, I think it is the name, the pronunciation is probably awful, who wrote that in macro, but uh, we, we can maybe extend to some of the micro, uh, what has been taught in the last 30 years is not only wrong, it is uh, uh, negative. Uh, negative contribution to, uh, to teaching. I have nothing against math or game theory or whatever. There are wonderful books by experts in game theory like Bernard Guerrien, who teaches game theory and explains why there's limits. There is also a book by Yannis Varoufakis, by the way, and uh, I am in favor of doing that. When I was head of the department, you were not Yes, yeah. Yeah. At the beginning of the reshuffling, I made a proposal in the spirit actually of uh, Schumpeter, if you will read this on economic analysis, for basic courses, institutions, micro and macro, economic policy, uh, mathematics, statistics, huh? and uh, history. Possibly history, economic history, history of economics. It was rejected. Hmm? Uh, one can, can think about that. But the problem is to what we want from these students. We teach uh, math over the top. Math should be taught by economists. The, the, the mathematics which is needed in the undergraduate is not the mathematics that our mathematicians teach. In theory, it was Massimo Egidi, you know, there are, you need a 200 book on, on mathematics to do that kind of things. Those who, do, who go into, it's, it's, another, it's another thing. And, and uh, you know, uh, you say that it is moribund. I, I wanted to quote this, I, I, I didn't have the time. But there was a famous panel in Italy, when does it works in 2008. Uh, the panel was about the evaluation of research. Pasinetti did a um, uh, minority uh, report. Some of his criticisms were uh, accepted by others, like FITUC, etc. Uh, the, the leader of the panel was Tabellini. And Tabellini, in the end, he said, you know, the real problem is that, that Pasinetti does not see it, is that Italian good economists need to go to the U.S., hmm, where there is much more <laughs> sensibility, by the way, to the crisis. And now we are uh, all stage of a sect of moribund economists uh, that don't want to be on the market, uh, don't, want, don't want to be evaluated. It depends. If the evaluation is the referring procedure as, is, as it is taught to be, what would be accepted? Are only those who accept those kind of methodology 
So I agree with you uh, on a lot of uh, good things which are done, uh, but they got the poor version of, of the world. They don't want that we go to the richer version of those, uh, of those uh, conflicts. I decide to name all the oldest huh? I am in the mid-generation. I think I am one of them. But they are even younger colleagues with, with, with whom I am happy to, to fight. Uh, they are brilliant. Brilliant. Simply, they have been killed in the, in the competition for political economy. Yeah? And there are a lot. You go from the people like Alessandro Vercelli, who is older than me, uh, to people like Emiliano Brancaccio, who is younger than me. Uh, you know, we are full of brilliant uh, people. Uh, let me go to Lucarelli. Uh, Stefano, you know my, my, my answer to both questions. To the demand driven, no. Even though I would not fetishize uh, that the students are always uh, are always right. They come back uh, in answer. The mainstream, I think that there are two mainstreams, uh, generally speaking. But the situation is much more complicated now. There was the mainstream going down directly from the general economic equilibrium. And there is what is imperfectionism. Most of what you said is imperfectionism. Yeah? Those who know general economic theory but know that there are imperfections and you must go that way. But I did a, a survey of economic theory in 2005. I wanted to discuss it with Piccolo, but he said no, because I don't know macro. I don't, then he's able to judge if it's macroeconomics or not. Uh, and I said what has been said by, by Joe. Uh, the, the, there are new trends. And I was quite quite effective to understand the new trends, even to, towards uh, exper uh, experimental economics, behavioral economics, uh, uh, the discussion, etc. A lot of the things of the heterodox are there. You can have everything starting from individual, uh, individually, uh, methodological individual, etc. Uh, you know, uh, what I am advocating is something else. It's a monetary analysis which is macro founded. Mm? I think it is the only thing that actually allows to understand what is going on. Sorry, I'm exactly on the, on the other. But I think that my idea of the life of, of in a decent department, faculty of, uh, of economics, is to allow for all these to be present and discuss. Not the winner takes all, uh, even if the winner were me. Uh, very, very, very quickly about your, your questions. I, I agree when you agree with me. I agree with all, what, what you added. I just want to uh, say a couple of things. Uh, it is a, a kind of personal habit, so maybe it's, uh, it's faulty. But I would never sign something in support of students. I think that my ethical duty is somehow even to resist or give a different opinion and they have to commit patricide, possibly in an elegant way, uh, uh, not to accept. Uh, so my duty towards them is to give them questions, uh, but in, in, a, in a dialogue. Uh, what is economics education for? No, no, I think that everywhere there is uh, something about economics, we should give them initially uh, the, what, what I, 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 I said. My courses were in political science. I was coming from law. Uh, uh, if you go into business economics faculty, you can't have somebody who taught you only one theory that let you think that, uh, unfortunately, the New York are right about that, that there is something called the production uh, function. No, it's not there. That if you reduce the wage, you will have more demand for labor. And that is what is hammered in the mind of the, of the students. About the business of action, we probably agree. But one 
one request uh, always of the students is for more realism. No. I am very much against the idea that realism leads you everywhere. But it, this is a discussion within the... Uh, you asked me something about uh, the debate policy theory. I can go into, into that. But let us say you should read the Czech Money and Empire. And you, you have immediately the idea that those who are for mm, the fiction of uh, laissez-faire are talking about the fiction. And there is another line. And this is uh, went into his own newspaper articles. Graziani. Graziani is very difficult, different from the Cecco. The Cecco is very historically rich. In Graziani, as in Napoleoni, uh, as in the people that they most like, when they write an article in, uh, on a journal, you see the theory and the model behind. Eh? And you know, when Graziani became secretive, uh, he wrote about uh, the, 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 the political situation, so, so that it, it is really a long, uh, a long, a long, a long list. Uh, I think that we have to stop here. Yeah, I'm very sorry, but time is over. Well, thank you very much to Ricardo and Joe. Was personally was really, you know, sorry, a very nice discussion. So thank you very much again.